Now I will call to order <laughs> the Thursday, March the 8th, uh, no, Thursday, March the 22nd, uh, public hearing of uh, the Planning Board of the City of Northampton. Uh, we begin every meeting with a period of public comment. This is for anyone who has comment on an item that is not on the agenda. Item not on the agenda. Yeah, but, but is it about the items that are on the agenda? Yeah. Uh, I don't have an agenda. Oh. I received this. Oh, okay. Then, yeah. then, you'll, then you'll be a separate public comment for that. Okay. okay. We, this is just an open meeting thing that we have to do. No. No, that's okay. Um, so hearing none, we will move to the items that were continued from March the 8th. Uh, and that, are, that is uh, four public hearings and presentations for Verizon Wireless to add telecommunications equipment to existing utility poles in front of 12 Summerfield Street, Florence, map ID 29-113, in front of 275 Elm Street, Northampton, map ID 31A-10, uh, on the existing utility pole in front of 27 Ladd Avenue in Florence, map ID 30B-81, and on existing utility pole near 101 at Riverside Drive, Florence, map ID 23D-049. Is there a presentation? Please identify yourself and do your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Attorney Michael Fenton. I'm with Schaff, Schwartz & Fenton. Uh, we have an address in Springfield at 1441 Main Street, Suite 1100. Um, joined here today by our Verizon Wireless team, Jay Latore, who's our radio frequency engineer, and uh, Tom Johnson, who's our architect and engineer with uh, Proterra Design Group. Uh, what is before you today is site plan uh, review for four utility pole installations. Uh, each of these installations uh, include certain support equipment uh, and one antenna uh, with the intention of providing uh, data and voice coverage in the immediate vicinity of each of these uh, facilities. <coughs> um, before I ask Mr. Latore to come up and talk about uh, the project design and what they're intended to do, I just want to um, alert the board that uh, this is not uh, new technology to the area. We, we are in a majority of uh, municipalities in western Massachusetts in the Pioneer Valley. Uh, very recently secured permission for very similar installations in Amherst. Uh, we're in South Hadley. We're in Springfield. Uh, we're in Longmeadow, East Longmeadow. Um, and uh, we found that this is a really nice solution that helps in a very innocuous way uh, to offload some of the data and coverage needs that we have. Uh, in the community. So we're very excited about this investment uh, in the city of Northampton and uh, the things that it will be able to bring to our customers in terms of uh, continuity of service. So uh, with that, I'll ask Jay to come up and talk a little bit about the radio frequency design. And uh, Mr. Johnson will be able to speak to the plans. Thank you, Mr. Fenton. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Latore. I'm a radio frequency engineer with Verizon. Uh, my address is 122 Forest Hills Road in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk to you a little bit about this technology, small cell technology. And then I'm going to walk you through um, some of the highlights of each of the four applications uh, that are before you tonight. So. Um, Verizon, uh, like all of the major carriers, utilizes a number of different types of structures to provide service uh, coverage and capacity to um, <coughs> residents in Northampton and all across western Massachusetts. Uh, our macro layer of service comes from uh, traditional types of wireless facilities like monopole towers, radio towers, um, large structures typically over 100 feet in height that are uh, necessary to broadcast service over a wide range of area, typically a two to four mile radius. Um, over time, uh, as services have been enhanced, as we've moved away from the 90s and into the 2000s, uh, the needs of our customers have changed. No longer uh, were our customers satisfied with just being able to make <coughs> a phone call and have it be clear, but um, data began developing in the late 2000s. And, now you could check your emails or send text <coughs> messages or check your Facebook account. Fast forward into the early 
20 teens and we started seeing the prevalence of things like video calls and watching YouTube videos and live streaming of uh, events or football games. And over time, we have seen uh, something close to exponential growth of the demand for the latest technology in the United States, which is called 4G LTE, uh, particularly on the data consumption side. And uh, more recently, in the last two years, as Verizon has launched a uh, voice uh, network, advanced calling over our 4G LTE network. And so uh, the needs of our customers have changed. They're no longer satisfied with just being able to make a voice call. Um, they demand 24-7 uh, service reliability, whether it be for personal use, connecting with family, for public safety reasons, for business reasons. We just had um, dinner at Fitzwillie's and the cashier uh, or the server that checked us out um, took uh, our credit card and used a, a point of sale interface and scanned it right there wirelessly to pay um, so for we could pay for dinner and that uh, type of technology oftentimes runs on wireless signals like Verizon's and so uh, what this has created is a very sh strong need for Verizon to continue to invest in our communities uh, with the use of small cell technology and the purpose of small cells is to uh, identify areas uh, in a small area, hence the word, typically somewhere between um, a quarter mile to a half a mile radius where uh, demand may be very high and there's a need to offload the demand from that large tower which is covering a large geographical area. Or maybe service is a little bit weak, the signal is a little bit less than desirable and there's a need to fill a small pocket of coverage but it's probably not necessary to build another tall structure to fill a small hole. And so it's a very nice complementary technology that we've been able to introduce in Western Massachusetts and all across the uh, United States in the last three and a half years uh, to augment our uh, technologies and services, enhance our experience for our customers, and at the same time take advantage of existing infrastructure. So what I'd like to do now is uh, very quickly just walk you through each of the four applications. Um, and I'm going to hold off on some of the technical piece of the plans. I'm going to allow um, Mr. Johnson to do that. But what I'll do is I'll just call to your attention each of the four utility poles and, and what we're trying to accomplish here. And I believe um, you should have uh, a coverage map associated with all of them. So I'll walk you through them um, and kind of explain the purpose of each one. So um, the first application, and I apologize if they're not in the same order um, as you read them, but we'll, we'll look at uh, 101 Riverside Drive, which Verizon calls uh, Northampton Small Cell 5. And if you look at the first coverage map, you'll see, and all of the maps will kind of have the same theme, you'll see a couple of uh, <coughs> three-sectored pie-shaped facilities uh, some of the names are cut off, but to orient you on this map, uh, one of them in the western corner is called Florence, and that's an existing Verizon facility that, that is co-located on a smokestack in Florence. And then you'll see in the southeastern corner, there's another pie shape, and the name is cut off, but it's called Northampton 4, and it's our existing facility on top of Thorns Market. And then if you look in the northeast corner, there's another facility right off of Route 5, King Street, and that is our Northampton 3 facility. That's that very large tower on King Street. I'm sure you all have seen it before. Um, in the middle, you'll see um, Horizon also has a uh, what we call an in-building solution for indoor coverage at Cooley Dickinson. And then you'll see in the middle, the, in a area um, that isn't colored in green, is um, our proposal here, Northampton Small Cell Number 5. Now what these maps are, are a coverage prediction um, of what we call reliable service. It means that based on our transmitter locations, their height, the orientation of the antennas, the signal strength, this is a calculated engineering estimate of what our reliable service is. And so green means reliable, and anything that isn't green means less than reliable. It doesn't mean completely devoid of coverage. It just means not as reliable. So it could mean that you have service outside, but if you go indoors, you might lose service. Or you might have service on the second floor of your house, but if you go to the first floor in an interior room, you might not have it. 
And you'll see here on the second uh, map that was submitted, it says Northampton small cell five mass, future 2100 megahertz 4G LTE coverage. That's the frequency that the Verizon radio emits. You'll see the same um, map, but now you'll see an area around um, that blue circle where the service uh, is starting to be filled in with additional coverage. And there's a third map that will uh, just show the service from the uh, proposed facility. It kind of give you an idea of what the uh, coverage that this facility can provide. And it, again, it, it's a smaller facility. Um, it's not meant to cover a large geographical area, but it allows Verizon to start to help uh, fill in some of these gaps for our customers. Um, what I'll do is just briefly go through the other three. They're all going to be kind of the same concept, um, so please feel free to stop me if um, you have any questions, but uh, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not being too redundant to you. Um, the next one, uh, Northampton Small Cell 6, this is the uh, facility that is uh, closest to 275 Elm Street. If you take a look at the current uh, 2100 megahertz 4G LTE best server map, you'll see the same sites, the colored in green, blue, and red. And this map's a little bit different because this is uh, what we call a capacity uh, best server map. And what we're trying to show here is, uh, assuming all things are calculated properly, the colors show um, you the approximate area where you would be served by that site. So if you're closer to the Florence site in the green, you're likely going to be covered by that site. If you're on the higher portion of King Street, you'll likely be covered by the Northampton site, which is in blue. If you're at Thorns Market or walking through downtown Northampton, you'll be in that red area. And if you move to the next page, it's a little hard to see, but you'll see that Northampton um, small cell facility filled in in blue, and it's kind of a a different teal uh, bluish color where this footprint gets filled in. Again, not a huge footprint, but Elm Street is a particularly busy um, area of the city when you think about Smith College and the traffic going up and down Route 9, and we um, are excited to be able to provide some enhanced um, service and capabilities in this stretch of Route 9. I'll walk you through the third one, which is called by Verizon Northampton small cell number eight. This is the utility pole that is closest to 12 Summerfield Street. And um, again, you'll see the same kind of map. You're gonna see some different facilities on here only because what I try to do is uh, keep the proposal towards the center of the map and then you can kind of see the other facilities um, that are nearby this area. So this is a facility that is meant to support um, a subdivision and neighborhood that is um, not too far from the Robert K. Finn Elementary. And what happens here is that a lot of the service in this neighborhood comes from our smokestack site in Florence. And um, although that site has got some decent height to it, it's about 120 feet, the smokestack itself sits almost at the river uh, water level. And so as you get kind of far away from the site and you deal with things like trees and homes, the signal really kind of gets beaten down. And so uh, this is more of a coverage solution uh, for Verizon to try and fill a gap um, that many of our customers and, and residents of Northampton experience in this neighborhood. And if you look at the second map where it says Northampton small cell eight, future 700 megahertz uh, 4G LTE coverage, you'll see that that gap is really nicely filled in uh, for our customers. And then if we look at the fourth application here, just to wrap this up, uh, the Verizon name is Northampton Small Cell Number 10, and this is closest to Ladd Avenue. Um, again, the um, maps kind of tell the, the tail here, and really this one was driven um, by some internal drive testing that showed that a, a couple of the businesses and other industry elements down here um, near Ladd Street, close to the river, um, outdoors had weaker than 
uh, reliable service. Um, and so kind of the same concept. We come in, we attach on the utility pole, we broadcast our service, and, um, you know, hopefully uh, even though a lot of those buildings are brick, um, you know, we'll be able to provide more robust service to that uh, more commercial area. And the three maps kind of show the same thing, the third map showing the uh, proposed um, maximum service footprint of that facility. And, you know, that, that's really the, the RF justification for these facilities. Um, you know, they're very carefully researched uh, to make sure that, um, you know, we're providing service in the areas that the city needs them both, uh, excuse me, needs them most uh, to make sure that we are uh, constantly enhancing our service for our customers and um, constantly responding to the demands for increasing services. And, um, you know, we look forward to uh, your review of our applications. And um, if you, it's totally up to you. If you'd like to ask any RF-related questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Otherwise, um, Mr. Johnson can speak about the technical nature, and then we'll all be available for comment, whatever you guys think is best. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Johnson. I'm with Procure Design Group. Our office is at uh, Four Bay Road in Hadley, just over the bridge. Um, I thought maybe the, the best way to kind of give you a quick overview of what we're talking about is to maybe give you, give you some photos of some, uh, just some recent installations and uh, just pass around some of them. Probably gives you the best idea of what we're talking about. And, uh, Installation for the small cell on the utility poles. Um, they're done through license agreements with the utility provider, in this case, National Grid. Um, Verizon goes out, gets an agreement with them. And then um, <clears throat> there's a, a phase of the work where they call it make ready work, where um, the utility company may have to uh, adjust the line up or down, or in some cases, bring in an electric service or fiber service to that pole. Uh, and then Verizon comes in, they have a small uh, cylindrical antenna that's the uh, that goes up on the top of the pole that's what you see here uh, and that's then connected to a, we call it a remote radio head it's the unit kind of halfway down the pole it's attached on a bracket gets bolted through the pole um, this also then um, is the radio head is powered uh, by an electric service so uh, it just runs overhead from the pole comes down uh, into a meter and a, a disconnect that then feeds into the, uh, it, it gets converted to from AC to DC, but then that then feeds the radio head. Then also a fiber service um, is pulled overhead from the pole. That comes into a little box and then also feeds it. So the, the antenna transmits, receives, and then sends the signal back through the landline. And, and that's how kind of the system works. Um, you know, in this case, um, there's four existing utility poles that we're proposing to install on. Um, they're pretty minimal installations. Takes a construction crew probably less than a day to install from start to finish. Um, and there's also, like I said, uh, depending, uh, there's a make ready process and some make ready work beforehand by the utility company if it's needed on the pole. Uh, for the work, it would typically be done on the shoulder of the street, um, similar to if you see a utility company truck doing line work. In most cases, it would have a police detail there with them, but um, they come in, they attach their stuff, then they're, they're in and out in a day. Um, that's pretty much the scope of it. Question: Is there um, is an aesthetic component to this work? And I'm just wondering: it, Are you governed by what side of the pole the work needs to be on, or can it be on any side, or? In this case, um, typically the, the equipment that's attached to the pole, um, the agreements with the utility companies want most of that on the downhill side cons uh, for traffic. So uh, in case the pole got hit for some reason, they want the electric meter and, and parts of it on the downhill side. And then there's also, within that agreement, there's required separations between the electric line and the equipment and between the antenna and the top of the, all that is kind of code-based stuff. 
Um, and so then, it's not really facing the sidewalk or facing the street. It would be in between. Yeah. So um, uh, it, not, it, it's some of these photos may be a little different because there's a driveway or something. Right. Else, but generally, if you're driving down the right hand side of the street, the electric meter would be on the far side of it. Um, so on the sidewalk side. Oh. No, no, not the sidewalk side. Oh. Yeah. The, the uh, down downstream side. Right. Uh, and then they're not going to hit that. Yeah, and a lot of it with these snow plows and stuff like that, they want it somewhat protected. It's a lot of this equipment. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I finally sunk it. Got it. The, um, the, the, the radio head is also, they're, they're elevated up too, so it's, right. it's not necessarily that big of an issue. Um, in this case, the, the antennas uh, for radio frequency reasons are on top of the poles. Some cases you may see around, they go on the side, but that has to do with the specific coverage objective that they're trying to hit there. So, um, I'm just curious, and I, I guess this would be a question back on sure. the coverage side. Um, for the technically uninitiated, um, this seems to have a very small, relatively speaking, footprint mm -hmm. from a coverage standpoint. That doesn't seem to be particularly economically efficient. <laughs> just, it, it just seems so small as to be curious about it, it, why is it is it because of the particular characteristics of as you said, like you know, Elm Street between Ms. Smith College and the hospital and the high school, and that there's just particular characteristics of a particular place that that small a footprint can make a big difference. Right. Um, well, every particular circumstances is is certainly unique but um, I would actually say in um, I'll preface this by saying that for my job for Verizon is not necessarily to focus on the most economical solution it's to focus on the best solution with the tools I have in this case we feel these are the best solutions but um, you know if I was to compare um, a small cell utility pole attachment to say uh, like a traditional tower um, you know, a lot of the work, you know, say related to, you know, building an access road, you know, building a foundation, you know, a, a steel for 150 foot tower, um, you know, um, and, and a lot of the other, you know, um, maybe work that falls under the National Environmental Policy Act is eliminated with, through this. You know, we take advantage of, you know, existing infrastructure, um, you know, um, that is well regulated and well maintained. Um, and uh, again, you know, I, I would point to a lot of these examples as, as saying, um, you know, they're, they're purposely small because they're fixing small areas. So, you know, I, I think actually of the four, you know, the one that really does the best job of, um, you know, um, meeting up with that phrase, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, is that uh, Northampton Small Cell 8 facility. Uh, which is closest to Summerfield Street in, the, in that uh, a suburban neighborhood. If you, you kind of look at the breadth of this map, you know, this map probably if from the center, you know, has close to a two, two and a half mile radius. And, we're, and then if you look at that dot showing where the proposed facility is on that first uh, map, you know, we're really talking about a small area here. So, you know, in this circumstance, we're able to utilize existing infrastructure um, you know, attached to it in a, with a s small number of attachments, it makes it, you know, fairly innocuous, and uh, achieve the coverage goal without the need to maybe, um, you know, try to find somewhere in a subdivision to, to put a pole 150 feet in the air. And I, I think certainly it's a reasonable argument to say that um, it's a more appropriate solution. Um, similarly, in some of those other examples that I shared with you that are more capacity-based, um, you know, the world is changing in terms of our demand, and, and sometimes we find um, in order to maintain a reliable level of service, we have to make our facilities smaller because, you know, once they turn on and someone realizes, okay, instead of, I don't know, posting a picture to Instagram, it doesn't take me five minutes anymore, it takes me five milliseconds. Inevitably, what we see in our business is that same person who wouldn't post one in a day because it drove them nuts how long it took, uh, now post 20 in a day because now it's so easy. Or that person, that business owner that never decided to do point of sale wirelessly, now 
only does it wirelessly. And so the demand can grow pretty quickly once we introduce these services. And so sometimes keeping them small is advantageous because the larger they are and their footprint is, the more likely they'll take additional traffic and put more demand on it. So, um, but again, you know, we think it's the right solution for these areas and that's the focus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the board before I open the public here? Is there anyone from the public who would like to make a comment tonight? Good evening. My name is Delia Martinez. I own property at 289 Elm Street here in Northampton. Um, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that two of my neighbors did not receive this little card that I received. And the only reason I knew that the, uh, that the meeting is today is because I kept calling downtown because no one ever called us. And we are the properties that are between Massasoit and the Ottoman. We are right there. And there was no notification that the meeting was changed. I knew because I kept calling to double check because unfortunately winter is still here and we've had some snowstorms that have disturbed everyone's life. And, and you know, that's what happens. Uh, first of all, I have to say that um, I'm here by myself because um, my neighbor in the corner, her husband is an ER doctor and he works this shift and she has a baby, so she couldn't come. The other neighbor, um, she's an OBGYN and she had babies coming tonight, so she wasn't able to come. And uh, then the other neighbor, um, she had planned three weeks ago that one of her family members were coming in from California and she had to go to the airport to pick her up. So, you know, the fact that things were changed, uh, it left me to come here to talk to you. Um, we, all of us, my neighbors and I, bought these properties, historical properties on Elm Street in that spot because we wanted to be in a residential neighborhood uh, that was quiet and that, um, you know, it was something that it was nice to be in that kind of neighborhood. Um, we pay a lot of property taxes, as you well know. And um, we are concerned that um, I gave my name a number to the woman that I called on the phone, and she gave me a copy of the whole application, and I had to go and uh, print it so that we could read it. I met with my neighbors, and we discussed everything. On page 16 of this application, you have um, You have the picture on the right side of the typical wiring diagram. And it seems like in here, they have five different boxes before they put the proposed antenna at the top. And it seems to be, you know, quite a bit to put in that pole. We already have, um, one electrical pole. Well, is this the picture this, you're? This is my cup. What? Is this the picture you're referring to? I just want to make sure I'm looking at the same thing. Oh, the plan. Okay. Yeah. So do you understand? This is not a new pole. This is equipment that's being added to an existing pole. Um, there was no pole there uh, before. I know that there's a pole between um, my property, my house and the one next to me that is an electrical one that has the, the electricity. Right. That we've had, I've been in my house 18 years and it's been there for 18 years. Right. That's the pole, that's the, this is the pole, the, by the, the pole that's right near the autumn end. No, no, that's not, that's not the one. That's where the little yellow yeah, sign is. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one. This is this is the ottoman. This is Manor Road. Well, That's they, they, they put that pole. pole there, but my house is the one 
that has the two structures. You know, the second house from as I saw it in, it's my house. And right here is an electrical pole with all kinds of electrical wires coming in from this side of the street to this side of the street. Okay? This, this but not that. Right, that's the one they're talking about. That's an existing pole. This. So that's the one they're going to add to. Right. They're, they're not putting in a new pole. I understand what you're saying, but I'm talking about how many boxes of equipment it's going to be in it. I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about a new pole. So the, I, I, I think they're, she's referencing you know, a typical wiring C4 where they show the disconnect in the, in the other boxes and so forth. So there, you're correct. There are four to five pieces of equipment that will be mounted to that. There are five pieces according to my pictures, mm -hmm. yeah. which is the one that was sent to me. It was sent via email, and I had to have all these things printed because you can't really see from the email, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. then they have the typical equipment. Then they have the antenna detail about 12 and a half inches wide and 36 and a half inches high. And when I called Verizon, they told me that that was, that that was metal because it didn't explain, um, it didn't give details in this picture that I have. So they said that it was gonna be heavy. So I called, since the, the pole that is there has wires going to the other side, um, I called National Grid and they told me that they had elect electricity wires in that pole also. And they said that um, if um, five boxes were added to it, that if we have a lot of wet snow and it could get heavy and that could fall. So um, we were concerned about that because um, each one of us paid enough money buying the properties, never mind how much we have added to them in the last 15 or 18 years. And we don't want any more um, problems that could cause damage to our property. And if you would be uh, so kind, maybe since we have an expert here, if maybe we can have to go ahead and have the expert address your concern, you know. No, I, I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying to you is that I've owned enough properties that I understand that whatever is not on paper, it doesn't exist. You know, we all, we all do things with advancement. It's not that I'm against technology. My son is a computer expert. He works at Golden Sachs in New York City. My house is almost 7,000 square feet. I have a router in the back of the house on the second floor and another router in the front so my adult children can have all the internet and all the wonderful things that they do nowadays, you know? So it, I'm not against this. All I'm saying is that some of these things are concerning. On page 17 here, I have uh, that says construction on the sheet. Um, it talks about the mounting bracket details and it looks here that it's, you know, it has a lot of parts, which I'm sure it does. And uh, again, it has an antenna pole, another mounting bracket detail, and then it has another AW detail. It looks like it's um, like a box that puts the other piece of equipment inside of it that holds it. At least that's what it looks like from here. And then on, uh, On page 15, then we have all the parts that they're gonna put in. 
and it uh, it starts, you know, from the bottom. It gives details about all these little boxes, fuses that they're putting in, and um, all the way up to the antenna way at the top of it. And it has measurements of of how much they have in it. Again, I, I, I feel like you're, you're concerned about adding this to an existing pole, which then could make that pole more dangerous and perhaps cause property damage, if I'm understanding your concerns. And, and I'm wondering if maybe uh, one of the gentlemen could help allay some of those concerns by explaining how uh, the construction and installation goes. No, I, I mean, I know how to read, you know, I understand. Uh, on page six, it says at the bottom that this is um, a planning objective that they have on page six at the bottom, and it says that they want to invest in infrastructure to support business development and cellular capacity. You know, that's, that's wonderful, but we have historical properties in an area that we want it to be residential. Just like when I bought that property, um, I didn't buy a property on King Street that has all kinds of businesses for the businesses to be able to have a lot of technology, which again, I'm not saying that it's not important. I know it's very important. All the bottom line is that we would like to see if this same poll that they want to add for businesses to be able to have more technology or more accurate technology, have a tablet or like the iPhone that I carry that connects you know, quicker and, and you can transfer um, documents and all kinds of things. That is really wonderful. We just would like to see if you can put that poll in front of the high school where the park is because there's no historical properties there. You know, it's a park. And, and what it is is we, property owners that pay massive amounts of taxes, do not have to worry that something might happen. Not because these men are not incompetent. I know that they're very well educated and that they know what they're doing. but. Every time we have the news, we, the weather is crazy. You know, California slides down the mountain. I mean, all kinds of things happen all the time. And I do not want to lose, and my neighbors don't want to lose, the massive amounts of money that we have put to live in that area. We do not want to take any risk. It's not, again, we are not against it, but another, you know, half a block to the other side, there's what, like 10 acres of land in front of the high school that they could put the pole right there. And it's only like six, you know, a little bit down. It's, it's not even, it doesn't even get to Dunkin' Donuts. You know, it's a very small. This isn't a new pole. Yeah, Just to, to clarify, it's not a new pole. I'm, I'm not saying that is a new poll. I'm saying that adding the equipment, okay, they can use a poll that is already in front of the high school. And we do not have to worry about our properties if something happens. Uh, I hope you understand that. Uh, yeah. Because when tragedy happens, like, you know, because of weather or whatever, that houses are damaged, it's, it's on us, it's, it's not on anybody else. Nobody else is gonna come in and say, oh my God, this happened. Ma'am, I just wanna point out, if you look at the map, I, I don't think if the pole fell, it would hit any structures. It's not close enough to any of the other structures, even the Autumn Inn, which it's closest to, it would not hit any structure. I think if you look at the, the map, it's, a, it's not that big a pole, it's, I, it's an existing I, pole. I understand that, but when I talked to um, National Grid and I called um, Boston 
the Better Business Bureau to explain the situation because I didn't know where else, you know, my neighbors and I didn't know where else to call. They said, well, that they were gonna call me back. And they called me back and they explained about the area, about where the high school is, that it doesn't have residential houses next to it, and they could put that equipment there, and it wouldn't be any problem to do that. Yeah, I think uh, the, uh, the issue, the dead spot, isn't right. at the high school, it's in this area, and it's a very limited, the, the equipment they're talking about using only serves a very limited area, so if they move that 10 poles up the road, it's not gonna- It's not 10 that. poles up the road. I'm, I'm just saying, if they move it 500 feet up the road, it's not gonna serve the area in question. So that's why they that's why they proposed oh, that to, to be there. If, if you go to the other side of Elm Street, like if my house is here and right here is the autumn Inn, if you cross the street mm -hmm. in that corner, there's a medical building mm -hmm. that doesn't have a house on it. And there are two poles right there. They could use one of those they put they, it in. They could, but they, they've identified that this is the poll that gives them the best result for what they're trying to accomplish, which is to give better coverage to the people who live in that particular area. So it's not something that's transferable to, you know, it, it's very site specific. And, and it is to go on an existing poll. Just for the sake of argument, can one of you speak to that? But you don't poll understand. You Ma'am, ma ma hold on, sorry. Could one of you speak to the fact if there's a poll across the street at the medical building and there's a poll in front of the autumn in, does do you have latitude to which poll to use or if you're gonna work with national grid? If you look at the map, I mean I've lived here eighteen ma years. Ma yeah, yeah, let, yeah. let me have give them a chance to we're, respond. We're trying to answer your question for you. Okay. Maybe while he's looking through I could okay. answer one of the earlier yeah. questions. If you come up to the podium, please. Um, there's a couple questions I thought I might be able to field. Um, one of the reasons I gave you the photos to kind of give you a sense of what the installation looked like. Uh, when you do look at the wiring diagram, there's a number of different pieces to it. Um, if you look at that, what we call the remote radio head, which has the, the radio and then it's got a bracket and the bracket attaches to the pole. Some of those boxes are actually behind the radio head so that it, it contains multiple pieces of equipment, but it's, it's, um, it's all tucked together on that one bracket and then this one. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a, there's a fiber box shown as a box on there. But if you look at the photo, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little guy like that. Um, and then as far as the pole, uh, the structural capacity of the pole, in this case, the, the work is done through a license agreement with National Grid. Uh, Verizon put the application in with them. Um, they do, they, uh, them specifics on the equipment that's going to go on the pole. National Grid reviews it. They do an analysis of the pole, and then they, after they confirm that the pole has capacity, uh, give, a, give a license back to to uh, Verizon to install on it. It, it. National Grid does that analysis. In this case, we do that structural analysis on other uh, Forever Source and some other companies. So it is something they look at in detail. To be honest. What we find is the, the line loads significantly load the pole more than the equipment that we put on it because it's a heavy line, depending on if it's in line or without line. So that is, you know, 90, 95% of what loading goes to a wood utility pole as compared to the small boxes that are going on the vertical loads. Mm -hmm. So, we'll speak. Um, thank you. And, and I'll just add um, that the question was in regards to potentially looking at utility poles um, across the street. Um, I have knowledge of the area. I know in this particular circumstance there are um, electrical wires extending across that portion of Elm Street. Um, I don't have with me an entire site selection survey of those uh, particular utility poles, but I can make a presumption uh, based on the fact, and Mr. Johnson, please tell me if I'm wrong, that this pole only has secondary power on it. This is a lower level of voltage that is usually used to bring service to like residential uh, homes um, that the other side of Elm Street likely has primary power on it. And National Grid does allow uh, co-location on primary power. That's the high voltage wires you always see at the top of the poles. Um, but there's a number of factors that go into utility pole, telecommunications, site selection. Um, 
those poles hypothetically could be co-locatable, um, but they may have things like transformers on them. Those are those large step-down um, voltage units that take the power from the primary level to the secondary level. Those are not co-locatable by national grid. They may have um, risers, which are like PVC pipes that rise up the side. Those, if they have primary power lines in them, those are not co-locatable. They may have primary power going in multiple directions. Those are called junction poles. Those are not co-locatable. So, um, you know, the pole that we picked um, makes sense for Verizon, first of all, because um, it is the right location to enhance our services. And in addition, um, you know, the fact that it's secondary only, the fact that it is not obstructed, uh, anything on the top of the pole um, makes it uh, a more appropriate choice in this situation to Verizon to co-locate on and frankly is more preferred when possible by National Grid because that business is, you know, their main line of business is not to provide Verizon wireless service. Their main line of business is to provide electrical service to the community. Uh, you know, they, they work with us um, and uh, we work with them. That's the make ready process and so when we can, when we can take advantage of existing infrastructure that has the room for our services, um, that passes a structural analysis, um, that provides a benefit to the community and um, doesn't necessarily encumber poles that National Grid might deem of greater importance, we, we tend to feel that that's an appropriate choice for site selection. So again, not being able to speak about any other specific pole you know, we, we feel that it's an appropriate poll to attend. I understand what you're saying, but the poll that you're looking at is right next to the first driveway that the Ottoman has. And if you move like from here to that window, they have another driveway going out. In front of it, there's a street. And right in that corner, there's another pole. Ma'am? I think we're going beyond the, the scope of this particular No, I'm area. just saying that because there's no house there, right. that there's a commercial building yes. in there, uh, it doesn't it doesn't cause any trouble. It's, it's the kind of thing that you're not going to lose reception for six feet that goes across the street. Ma'am? I understand what you're saying, but my statement to you and the board would be respectfully that we don't believe that our current proposal um, is inappropriate. And there could be other polls that are appropriate, but we feel that this poll is appropriate. Yeah, but you know, I understand what you're saying, but the kind of thing is that we are the ones that live there. We are the one paying property taxes, and we are there because we wanted to have something simple. We don't want massive amounts of things in front of us like it's on King Street because it's a commercial street. We live in a residential historical area that has minimum amount of things in it. That's, Ma that's what I'm saying. I, I think we're, again, I think we're going a little beyond the scope of this particular hearing. Um, uh, the applicants have gone through the appropriate procedures and, and gone to the appropriate bodies within the city to be here tonight to present their their proposal. Um, certainly appreciate your concerns uh, and now it's it's on our it's our job as the board to review both sides and, and make a determination. But I, I think we understand your concerns and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to come. Well I came because we were told you know uh, that because we are property owners and taxpayers that we had some saying on how our neighborhood, you know, develops. It's not a commercial area. And we appreciate that. And, and it's just very frustrating that, you know, I understand that they work for this company, but we are on our own. We don't have a company that has 400 million in the bank. Well, but you do have the city of Northampton and you know, th this has been a process. They're, that's why they have to come here. They have to go through the process that has been established by the city, by the council, to make sure that neighborhoods are protected. Well, I hope so. And if there's any difference 
then my neighbor said that we will ask to have another meeting with us because between all of us, we pay massive amounts of tax dollars to and, the staff. And that is certainly your, and your right. And we, before it is denied or approved, if there's any difference, we would like to meet with you. Okay. All of us. Well, we appreciate that. We'll go through our process. You always have the ability to appeal the decision or to take it to city council, take it to your selection. Are we going to be notified? Of the decision? Of the decision? Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna make it in just a few minutes. So if you just wait, then you'll, you'll know if, uh, what the decision is. I'm sorry, it's just that it's very frustrating. Uh, and I can understand that. Owners. I have been on that side of the podium. I believe you, I can, I can empathize with you and, and, and understand what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Other questions, comments from the board? Just a confirmation. So in general, the polls, they're existing polls, but they're gonna be replaced. And so a 30 foot pole is gonna be a 34 foot pole when all said and done. In this case, it, the pole is uh, an existing wooden utility pole to be replaced. Uh, let, me, let me answer the crux of your question. You know, um, in some cases they will be replaced. In some cases they will not be replaced. Uh, yeah. and, and but there's existing poles at each site. Correct. Okay. We are not, not adding a new pole. Quantity is not going to change. Creating not, a new ground. Right. That's what I. Yeah. There's two of each. Two, two are going on the existing one. Two are going on the one. Yeah. Questions, comments from the board? Or a motion? Uh, I just wonder if uh, have there been any poll that failed after a blizzard or with this installation that because the way the lady puts in, it seems that she's concerned also that any eventual weather can overwhelm and the pole can fall because of this is over with all these boxes. And uh, so I never heard about it, but it's a, it's a point that I bring it up. If there is such things, have you guys, I think we are saying. So, well, I mean, electric poles fall all the time in storage, yeah, yeah. so. But that will not be a case of uh, adding a little more boxes right. or. But there's a standard, I mean, you know, yeah. when you see the guy wires, they're there to yeah. prevent, um, and it's all engineered so that the structure itself is installed um, based on the weight that will be on the pole and the height. So, um, you know, it has to be designed to meet standards so they don't over <laughs> and you know I just felt I have to bring that up so I, mean, I think this poll this this particular poll the one on Elm Street is is for secondary power it's not a big it, it, it doesn't have you know, a lot of primary on top and a lot of weight I don't I, and I don't think this added equipment is going to in any way make this more susceptible to falling over than it already is um, and I, I think the, the casual observer will never even know anything's changed after this work is done. I move to close public comment. Second. I need a second. I can't. Second. Second by Dan. <laughs> I can't do the second. <laughs> All in favor. I thought you said second. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. Aye. All opposed. Questions, comments? Motions from the board. I, I, I think it's it's innocuous uh, amount of work. We've 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 put antennas all throughout the city on, on sides of buildings and and I and I get the residential versus commercial, but um, this is not a commercial zone. But I don't think adding an antenna to this pole is going to make it a commercial zone. So um, and there is commercial there. Right, yeah. right. This, it's right next to the autumn end, which is right, yeah, across and, the way. and across from the medical center. So, um, if, if you could argue that if on, in any area on Kings on Elm Street, that's where you'd want to put it, because that's the the most commercial, even though it's not right. a commercial area, it's like the most commercial yeah. area of Elm Street. Right. Till you get all the way up to yeah. Right. I make a motion. 
uh, move to approve the site plan by Verizon, uh, Verizon Wireless to add telecommunications equipment to existing utility pole in front of 12 Summerfield Street, Florence Map ID 29-113, in front of 275 Elm Street, Northampton Map ID 31A-10, in front of 27 Lad Ave, Florence Map ID 30B-81, <coughs> and near 101 Riverside Drive, Florence Map ID 23D-049. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, and thank you. Thank you. I did not. You did not. So and and ours. But I thought we had the. But he has to recuse, so we don't have. Oh, you have to. You can't just ask. You have to. Sometimes you ask if I want you this to. This one I can't, because I know the I know the yeah. builder. He okay, so, okay. This one you yeah. have. To. <laughs> okay. This one is, is a clear conflict. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion? Motion. <laughs> Second by. Wow. Whether he knows or not. All in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you. And what is the process for us to, uh, to appeal? To appeal. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the decision will be issued to the clerk. Um, and then notice gets sent to the abutters. The decision's been issued, and it has the date of it, uh, the date that the appeal period runs. Um, you get the notice, and then anybody who is um, everyone within 300 feet is notified. Um, and then the appeal process, you would take the appeal to Superior Court and file a copy with the city clerk. So just just like you got that, you'll get a notice of the decision to, yeah. because you got because you're an abut you're considered an abutter. So you got this, so you'll get another one telling you of the decision. And then it says exactly what to do to appeal. It says it'll tell you that you can appeal in accordance with the state statute that tells you and that gives you the appeal deadline. I know, but there must be a process. Of what do you have to do and where do you have to write? It references the, the, um, the state, statute, state statute, and then you can go to that and see what exactly what right. the what the and procedure that's in is. In the computer? Yes. Yep. The state statute? Yeah, you, you can look it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to receive notification. Yeah, everyone that got one of these cards will get the will also get the notice of the decision. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's the bigger Thanks. thing. <laughs> pull up what you're talking about. That's my house. Oh, oh look, gee, look at that. Hands, it's look at that. What service do you have? If oh. I go inside my house, I can't. Oh, really? I can't. I, you're kidding. No. And so I was thinking, oh, great. And then I look it at the bubble, right and there. literally, it's right out there. I'm like, come on. Well, that's what I. D that's why I didn't. You're I mean, gonna have to walk they're the so <laughs> They're so small. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I understand that it's like filling, you know, it's like filling so leaks really or something. If I guess they but put it over to the medical the center. Curtain. That would probably get to my house. Yeah. Close the curtain. Wow. Close the what? But you know, it's still Elm Street, so it doesn't matter. The aesthetics are the same. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, uh, that's the part. Yeah, I still don't. I mean, the, you know, I mean, the one on Ryan Road, I could see where that like fills that yes. neighborhood. That's yeah. where.